Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and uh, today we're going to take you through all the steps of starting a young horse. This is Christina with her horse Victoria. Christina had another horse um, that was uh, un tragically killed and hit by a car with another rider riding that, that was half leasing the horse, not their fault, but uh, um, tragically lost the horse that way. And this was a four year old Arab that where she was boarding, the people were kind enough when she lost that horse to give her this horse. So it was a horse that no one had done anything with. Um, Christina watching our videos had started the horse just lunging a little bit. So when it came to me two months prior to this, um, it had started lunging just a little bit and that's about all that it knew how to do. So we just started right then and you can see how easy it is. So I want to show you this, how easy it is to do all of this with young horses that haven't already uh, learned bad habits from bad riding or bad postures that we now have to undo or broken necks or whatever the case may be. So I'm going to take you here through this, all of these steps. This is about eight weeks into training, but I'm doing this all on the same day and taking you through all the steps that we went through to get the horse to where it is now being ridden. So the first step is this step of just getting the horse to stretch into the contact without any gear on whatsoever, which you don't need at all in the beginning. Almost all young horses um, will start to stretch within five or ten minutes of the first time you lunge them if they are allowed to do so. But so many people today, they start young horses and they're already strapping them up in all kinds of straps and things before they even get the job started. So they're well on their way to failure right in the beginning. But look how beautifully this horse is engaging through the top line. This, once again, I said this is a four-year-old Arab. And how completely relaxed she has already become. How beautiful her body has developed in just this short little period of time. This is actually only... This is a, yeah, about, about two months from when we started, so I'd say something like that, just before I left to go on this trip to Australia where I am now. Look how nicely she's able to keep the horse out at the end of the line. Christina has done a really great job of going through all this process with me. And you can see every time the horse gets a little distracted, she just pushes the hindquarters away from her a little bit, and that puts the horse right back down into the stretch again. The lovely floppy ears and how nice and relaxed the tail is. And swinging very nicely over its back. So that is the first step. Now this horse we have graduated into a bit. She already had a bit on the horse, just a little bit, but it was not one that I approved of. And she changed to this French loose ring snaffle and there's been no problems ever since. Do everyone beware of these bridles out there now that are being marketed everywhere called Mylar bits. Um, it's just wrong thinking for somebody who wants to learn to ride correctly because these mylar bits put the pressure on when you touch the horse's mouth, you have pressure on the gums of the horse, on the lips rather than on the bars. If we're going to communicate with the horse, we need to communicate through the bars. And, uh, you know, their idea of these bits, you know, if you're somebody who's riding around yanking on your horse's mouth all the time, I suppose that would be the bit to have because you can't yank on the bars. But if you actually want to learn to ride and be able to communicate with the horse and have that communication be a two-way communication and not just you yanking on the reins, then we need to be able to contact the bars. And it's the same thing, you know, there's nothing wrong with bitless bridle, uh, riding bitlessly. You can certainly do it if you have steady hands. But it's just, you know, to think that a bitless bridle is somehow more uh, or more humane is just really wrong thinking because bitless bridles work off of the cartilage of the lower part of the horse's face. So, you know, and I have seen horses' faces that were literally broken and all the cartilage around their nose is broken from, from uh, shambone, uh, not shambones, but uh, uh, bozals and things like this, you know. So don't think that a bitless bridle is... is in is humane or any more humane it's it's what is in your hands and whose hands they are connected to so a good rider is never going to brutalize this horse's mouth and it's going to take the time as we are doing here you know to give the horse time you know to establish these lines of communication and for the horse to never fear the bit if the horse fears the bit then you have a real problem you're never going to have two-way communication with a horse that's afraid of of a, a real steady weight of the rein contact remember that's all it should be I just watched a little minute of a video earlier today that somebody sent me from this dressage training online and this person is just telling the horse is going horribly and the trainer just keeps telling him take more contact you must kick the horse up into that bridle you know it's just ridiculous it doesn't work that way it was no better at the end of the lesson than it was at the beginning the horse was broken over at the third vertebrae and hollow in the back so you know these are the things that we look at no matter what they're saying if that's the end result um, it's never going to be very good. And unfortunately, it's confusing, too, as Annie Siri has pointed out. Uh, we're just discussing about that. 
a lot of the old books, you know, they copied the right words down in the books, and then you see the pictures that they use as examples, and you can clearly see if your eye is educated that very often the pictures don't correspond with what the text is. But many of the books that were written, for instance, like uh, Podaisky's Complete Training of the Horse and the Rider, well, he didn't write that book, folks. He stole that book from the Spanish Riding School and put his name on it. And that's how he became famous. But if you go to the Spanish Riding School, as I did in 1976, I think it was when I first went there, and asked them, well, what about Podaisky? Why isn't he here? And uh, they explained to me everything that had gone on, that you know they really were not happy with him there because he stole their manual and made himself famous you know, uh, through the Disney movies and stuff that were done about it, and then, then proclaimed that he was a horse trainer. He had never been a horse trainer. He was a government administrator. So same thing that you'll see with the book uh, Dressage Formula. Egon von Neindorf didn't write the book. His student did, and uh, I'm not sure the student got it, but he wrote it all down, so the text in the book is very good. But this is what we're looking for for a young horse to get to this phase. I was just beautifully stretching into the contact before we go to the next. And that's just where I'd like to see. So now we've added the next step. So the next step is just to have the horse carry a saddle. Now, obviously, we've done this a few times. The first time we did it, she was a little, a little reactive, but not overly. Now she has a saddle on that actually fits. You know, it's not causing the horse any discomfort. So one thing you do have to watch out with young horses, especially Arabs are rather thin-skinned. She did develop a little uh, girth sensitivity there because she'd never really had a girth on, and uh, she got a little girth sensitive, so we switched her, as I always used to do, start horses in a... Uh, but she actually, the girth that she had was not fitting correctly. That was the problem as we worked out, and uh, she went to a string girth for a little while, and, and uh, that took care of the problem. So we must always be careful when we're first putting anything on a horse that... It's not rubbing somewhere. If the horse has had nothing on its back, then we have to we have to keep checking the elbows and around the girth area, that sort of thing, and be sure that there isn't something rubbing them because they can just be very thin-skinned, like you and I. The first time you do something, a new pair of shoes, right? It can, uh, if we're not careful, rub our feet a little bit. But you can see how now with the tack on, this is exactly we want where we want to get to. So with just carrying the saddle, no side reins, no anything else, just getting used to carrying the saddle on its back and the pressure of the girth. But you can see by this time she's completely accepted all of that. And once again, because we started with something that did fit her right, she was never overly reactive about it in the very beginning. We popped her back up maybe once or twice in the very beginning, and that was about the extent of it. But she quickly got right back down in the stretch, and as you can see, she's just as relaxed here with the saddle as she was without it. That's a beautiful stretch right there, and what a beautiful rhythm. It's all about developing that rhythm and understanding that, you know, the rhythm is what is guiding us. If we lose the rhythm, something is going wrong. We've asked the horse to do something too difficult for its level of, of, uh, of work, and that's always it. Too small a turn, whatever it is. But the rhythm is what tells us the horse is continuing to work through the back. If we start to lose the rhythm, once we have this, then we know that something's gone wrong that's stressing the horse a little bit, and, and it's, it's not able to keep that position over its back. In other words, I think it would usually be like working on a circle that's too small. So just like the, <clears throat> we did without anything on, we're now just going in the other direction. And you can see she picks up a canner with that there, but that's no big deal. We just bring it right back to the trot, very normal. And that's all you do. Don't make a big deal of it. But just with young horses, the idea of keeping, not letting them canner, you know, we don't work on things like transitions at this level. I hardly ever work on transitions. We work on getting the gates correct, and then the transitions just solve themselves. So we always want to be sure when working horses that we're not <clears throat> beginning to frustrate them by asking for things that are not possible. And uh, good transitions, if the horse doesn't have a good trot, and it isn't steady in the contact in the trot or the walk, it's, you can just bet that the transition between the two is not very, going to be very good. But we don't worry about that. As I said, as the horse becomes more confirmed over its back, all those things just become easy to do. All of a sudden, the horse will just be able to do a good transition. But the trouble with working on a lot of transitions is it's always stopping the horse and stopping the horse down. You know, this idea that people have that they, you know, when they I don't use the word half halt because I because it's a it's a bad translation of of uh, the German and French word. In the French, it means to balance the horse. It's nothing to do with halting.
So unfortunately, whoever first translated some of these terms into English, especially in that case, really did a bad, a bad uh, example of what it should be. If anything, we should call it a half forward because we can only balance the horse by getting the horse to engage more deeply under the body. So now you see we've added, now that we've had the horse used to having a saddle on its back, now because she has such long side reins, and this is a perfectly good way to do this, they're plenty long enough, we've just looped these long reins over the back of the saddle and behind the uh, stirrups there, and we've let the stirrups down, especially with sensitive horses. It's always a good idea to do a little lunging with the stirrups down so the horse gets the idea of something touching it on its side. And just doing that alone is a great help in getting horses used to having somebody on their back because they feel something and that little banging of the stirrups against the horse's side. Always, if you do that, though, just always be sure that they are up high enough that they're not hitting the horse right in the elbow. Like if these were another six or so inches down, they'd swing more and have a good chance of whacking the horse in the elbow as it moves. So that's the one thing to worry about when you do put the stirrups down like that. But once again, she's come back to the walk, and this is just what we're looking for. So now this horse is, is easily stretching down into the contact because there's, there's nothing trying to force her to do otherwise. And once the horse learns the stretch, now the next phase is to teach them to stretch into that contact. So at some point, we do always need to use side reins or long reins, just hooked up the way we have them here, where they're not really... All they're doing is giving the horse something to stretch down into. They're not interfering with the stride in any way or trying to hold the horse's head down in any way. But that's a beautiful stretch there. So once again, everything you see here has been achieved in less than two months of time from a totally green horse. But look how beautifully she's accepting everything. It's not being distracted. Now, not to say that this horse doesn't occasionally get distracted. It's a nice, calm day here. And horses will want to look at things. And when they do, you just lift your whip and send them on a little bit without being too severe about it. So I say when you ride, the worst thing you can ever do is stop and let horses look at things. Because if you do it once, they're going to want to stop and look at everything that comes down the pikes, if you will. It's a really good stretch here. Christina is also a Pilates teacher, so she very much understands uh, what we do. As I said, you've all heard me call say that many times. The correct training is really Pilates for horses. It's core engagement just like it is for a human being, only we're having to adapt it to um, a quadruped. But this is very good. You can see how she's not overreacting to those stirrups bouncing a little bit on her sides. And this goes a long way, once again, to making your first rides on a horse safe. There's no point, um, and in fact, I can, I can consider it to be idiocy to get on horses that, you know, are not in the A's or trained somewhat and try to ride them through it, if you will. I mean, many, many people have gotten themselves uh, maimed, if you will, trying to ride through it. I watched recently an exhibition by somebody in Europe of jumping on these young horses and they're reaping and leering and almost coming over backwards on them. And the guy lives through it and the people are cheering, but what's the point of that? I mean, one of these days the guy will do that and one of them will come over on his back. And it's certainly not something you wanna show other people that this is what you should go home and do. I've met a lot of uh, professional cowboys. Um, when I was young, I was friends with Jim Shoulders, who was the, considered one of the greatest all-around cowboy guys. And, and when I knew him, I was only in my early 20s, and he was probably 40, but you would have thought the guy was 70. And he'd broken every bone in his body. He could barely walk, had arthritis in every one of his joints. You know, and you know, he actually said to me once something like, I wish I'd never gotten on the back of a horse, you know, because you would have thought he was a 75-year-old man you know, at 40 years old. So once again, it always hurts when we come off horses, and if you do it over and over again, you're going to damage yourself. So, you know, I think we should always be working towards safety all the time, instead of just thinking, well, I'm, you know, being machismo, if you will, has gotten a lot of people seriously hurt when it comes to horses. So that was just what I'm looking for. She uh, stretched right into that contact with the side, with the stirrups down, so we know she's not overreactive. So now we're starting to get on. Now, we've gone through this before, but this is really maybe the 10th time we've gotten on our back, something like that, if it's even been that many times. 
But I wanted today to take you through every step so you can see each one of those steps must be there before you go on to the next one. So you can see how relaxed the source was with the saddle, with the rein, with the stirrups on it, you know, with a little bit of contact with those long reins. So everything there tells me this horse is now ready to get on. So that's what we're doing here and how beautifully she stands quietly. And really, she's been just this good since the very beginning. There was one day, now I always start them out, as I'm going to show you here. The first few days that I'm going to have a horse under saddle, I'm going to just walk the person. I'm not going to turn them loose. Now, I'm going to do that today, but, you know, in the first two weeks of doing this, that's all this was. It was getting up. Once we have the horse nice and calm, then we get on the horse, and we just walk the person on it. So we still have the person on the ground, uh, which helps the horse, do, which gives the horse a lot of confidence, you know. And, of course, we're there if something does go wrong. Uh, the first or second day I think we got on this horse, she did buck up. Something happened and, and she did buck up a little bit, but I was right there to stop it. You know, so the rider didn't have to suddenly clutch with her hands. So it's always a good idea to take this step, safety first, if you will. So once again, we get the horse used to uh, working next to us. And of course, we have worked this horse in hand a little bit too. Um, and that gets the horse used to having somebody working alongside it. And that's all we want to do. So that gives the horse confidence. So I spent a, a couple of weeks every time. Now, not we didn't get on her every day. Once again, this is probably still only about the 10th time we've actually been on her back. But the first few days would have been nothing but this. And then the first day would have been just in the same direction. Then I would have changed direction and walked her back the other way for a couple of days just to be sure that she's seen everything from both sides. As remember, the way the horse's mind works Um the way the horse's brain is split, they don't have crossover in their brain the way you and I have. So what they see with their right eye goes to the left brain, and what they see with the right, left eye goes to the right brain. But there's no connection between the two. So horses can actually, you know, see something. That's why we have to keep changing directions, in other words, because they have to see everything with both brains, if you will, and both eyes. That's why it's, um, it's possible to have a horse who's very spooky in one direction and doesn't care about anything in the other direction. Because something, you know, spooked them or whatever, they got away with some bad behavior in the beginning on that side. So once I've done that walking, the next step, once again, I would have done three or four days of that, making sure the horse is nice and calm. And then I simply just let the horse out on the lunge line. So I'm still there with her. Now look how nice this horse is starting to stretch. Now it's a little bit slow there. Obviously, we want a little bigger walk. But we don't press a lot of that stuff. Remember, when you're first getting on horses, it's just to get them to accept the idea that someone's on their back and let them relax. And that's just what she's doing here. And, of course, the increments of the amount of time that we ride, just like this, I mean, it would have been, in the first few days, would have been nothing but, you know, three to five minutes, maybe, walking somebody on her back and you know, to gradually get to where we are here. Once again, this is the end of eight weeks of work. And how beautifully she's accepting everything. Now, once again, we see how slow the rhythm is. Watch the back legs. They still kind of look like they're in, stuck in flypaper. Watch as she does stretch down, you'll see that improve, just like there. And all of a sudden, the hawk begins to make a little rounder circle, and the horse gets a little more swing in that walk. And notice how the, the rider is riding here, nice long reins, and she's able to widen her hands and able to keep that unbroken line to the horse's mouth, which is what we always want to do. Once again, remembering that that is something we do in the schooling ring. It's not how you go ride your horse in a horse show. This is a technique that we use when we're first developing these horses so that we can keep contact. Because if we, especially if you have short reins, it's almost impossible because you're always having to grapple up the reins every time you let the horse stretch. So by doing this, as soon as the horse starts to raise its head, you can just widen your hands apart like you're playing the accordion, if you will, to maintain that soft contact with the horse and let the horse know that it's not you're, you're going to be there one way or another, whichever way the horse decides to go with its head and neck. And, of course, as it stretches down, then we be sure that we really relax just to the weight of the rein, as you see her doing there. But it isn't much more than that, and it never takes much more than that. Once again here, the walk is a little bit on the slow side, but that's okay for what we're doing here for a horse just getting under saddle. But we just keep gradually trying to improve it.
That's the biggest thing with young horses, just getting them focused and keeping them relaxed. And with different horses, that takes different amounts of time. But I will tell you, I've started so many babies in my life. It's so easy to start horses that have not already been started by somebody who maybe didn't quite understand everything they were doing. Witnessed by all the broken young horses we have. It's just really too, too bad that you know, the breeding world just got so into all these futurity classes for babies and things because it's wrecked so many young horses. It wouldn't be bad if they expected them to work in the way they possibly could work at that age, but they don't. You know, we have these uh, testings, you know, for all these breed testings and stuff, and, you know, four years old are expecting them to be jumping 3-6 and be crammed into some kind of phony frame. Now, look how beautiful this is. We start the trot. She stretches right into that contact and stays right there. Exactly what we're looking for. And, of course, it's so important that we've gone through all these steps that the horse learns to be relaxed. Because you do have to remember that when we get horses over their backs, and part of the reason that people don't ride horses over their backs these days much, is that if you don't do it right, if you don't establish the relaxation and all that, you know, we're making these horses into big waves, so it's so important that they be uh, relaxed in the process because otherwise they have a lot more power. In other words, if they buck, they can buck you a lot harder if they're over their back. So it's very important that the control and the relaxation go right along with the training right from the very beginning. I mean, we witnessed by, you notice how many of the people who have, have been the advocates of Rolker, whenever they're, for instance, in a situation like at the Olympics and you see them get run away with because the, the crowd starts to cheer and they're looking for, you know, they're assuming that another blow is coming. So when horses have been tortured the whole time they're riding, anything new that startles them, they're thinking that's something else coming to hurt me, and especially if they're already in pain by something. I mean, a horse like Bailador was the most spooky horse I've ever seen in my life, and but he was in so much pain in his back was really the problem with him. And, uh, once we got him over the fact, got him over all the pain issues that he had in his body, and he totally relaxed. But if you're on them and they have kissing spine, and every time you go to do something, they go, Ooh, they get a zinger through the back, through the spine especially, well, of course, you know, they react very harshly about that. I mean, horses generally buck people off for the reason that they're sick of being tortured and they're looking for an escape. So if you give them one, Whereas a horse that's been trained correctly will become a partner in the work with you. You can, you can feel them cooperating with you and even enjoying the work that we do. But if they're always tortured, which means if, you have, if you're constantly pulling on the horse's mouth, you are torturing it all of the time. And all of these people teaching today, telling people to pull back on these reins all the time, you know, and you see how miserable the horses are. So I just watched one of these videos on, uh, of some very well-known person giving a clinic, and this horse is completely sway back, and all she, he keeps doing is telling her, pull back on the reins harder, pull back, hold more in your hands, and kick them. So they're trying to kick the back up underneath them while holding the neck in a position that makes it impossible for that to happen. And, you know, the horse is swishing its tail and grinding its teeth the entire time. I mean, it's never, it, does, it never takes two steps in rhythm. For all, for all the clinician keeps going, wow, look how fantastic. Well, it was never fantastic. In other words, as people like this have also ruined people's concept of what dressage is. Because beginners, you know, when they see some, somebody who's fancy and they think, oh, this person is respected around the world. Most people today are respected because they win ribbons. And, of course, all of our horse sports have been dumbed down to the point these days that the ribbons are pretty meaningless. Yeah, good stretch in the walk there. So this is the first phase of riding under saddle. And you can see how logically it went through every step. So while I did all this in the same day, this is only two months in, but I'm showing you where I took each horse to before I went to the next step. And you can see how the walk is starting to lengthen. At times it's really nice. <clears throat> and she starts to get the neck out and we start to begin to see her step more actively. And she comes back to a nice stretch. And you can see how just by her leaving this horse alone, the horse went into quite a nice transition that time without her doing anything at all. And that's what they will do. When they get used to staying over their backs, they'll stay there. So pretty soon when you have a good walk and a good trot, 
you'll start the trough from the walk one day and the head won't move. It'll stay right where it was because the horse has enough strength to be able to do that transition. Really good in this stretch here. And this, once again, is exactly what I'd want to see before I would turn a horse off of the lunge line with the rider. I would want to see just this, the horse that accepted the rider on its back. It's stretching deep into the contact. And look how even pretty round circle the horse even has. Once again, remembering that the only thing to straighten this training is getting the horse to lift its back. When you get them to lift the back, they become straight. Straightness is not just trying to position the front end in front of the back end. It doesn't work that way. You can spend hours frustrating yourself trying to do that, which I have watched people do over and over again with some of these people who call themselves straightness trainers. If you don't know that it's the back that straightens the horse, you don't really know much. So that was a beautiful trot work under saddle, exactly what I'm looking for. And as I said, in the course of all of this, there was one day that was maybe the second or so day we got on this horse that something bothered a little bit and she bucked up a little bit under her back. And, and uh, of course, I was right there alongside the horse, so that stopped immediately. And that's really the only uh, couple of bad steps we've had through the entire process. And that's how it should be. You always want to make everything as safe for yourself and safe for the horse as you possibly can. Horses are dangerous folks to work with. People are getting killed every day. Horses are being destroyed every day by bad training. You know, so many, uh, I feel very sorry for these, for a lot of children these days because whose parents were never horsemen and they're just easy prey for these trainers who see them coming. And, uh, and so many of these children are getting, getting maimed for life, you know, by virtue of getting with trainers who don't, uh, who don't teach in this way, don't teach correctly. And they put uh, kids on horses they shouldn't be on with hollow backs. And I mean, everything happens to them from falling down to getting bucked off or whatever the case may be. But way too many people get injured on horses. So what a beautiful walk this has turned into now. And now she's starting to stretch that beautifully. And once again, we, we got so the stretch in the walk before I ever went to the trot. So I would, that would be the next step. On the lunge line, just getting the horse to stretch into the contact with the trot, and with the walk rather. And then when we can do that, we can do a little bit of trot. Once again, not worrying about the transition, just letting it happen. And then worrying about trying to get the horse as, as well as we can over its back in whatever the new gate we're moving to, which would be the trot from the walk, of course. And at this level, we never skip gates. That is, you would never skip suddenly from the walk to the canter. It takes quite an advanced horse to begin to skip gates in the transitions, other than that is to go from the halt to the trot or from the walk to the canter. Or even more difficult, from the halt to the canter. So that was all very nice, exactly what we're looking for. So the next step is going to be to take the horse off the lunge line. So notice I still stay in the middle. So I'm still there as the horse's security blanket, if you will, a little bit, as we first just let her walk around us. With me in the center. And she gets to a very nice place here and starts to stretch out already. The walk begins to open up a little bit. And so the next step as you'd go on is simply to gradually, I'd stay on the circle, start trotting, which we've done a few times, but we ended before we got to that place. I felt like the horse had done enough for the day. But then you would stay, staying on that circle with someone in the center. Then you would start to trot work. And then from there, you'd begin to venture out around the arena. In other words, working away from your guide, if you will, who's standing in the middle, who was our lunger. So whenever we introduced any new thing, we we're always building off of what we had before, which is once again, in this case, would be the horse just working first on the lunge line, then working off of the lunge line, but still around the person. So not much has changed. We're only adding a little bit to what we're doing differently. So this is Will Faber from Art to Ride with Christina and her horse Victoria. It's again a lovely four-year-old Arab. 
Um, this is eight weeks, uh, about eight weeks into work. I don't even think it was that much, actually. But uh, she was in training with me for a month, and then she kind of worked on her own a little bit, and I helped her a few days, and then we, uh, I had the time to, to do this just before I left for Australia. But how beautifully the horses work throughout. So that's just what you want to do. There's all the steps to start a young horse to bring them under saddle. So remember, every one of those steps must be right before you go on to the next one. If the horse hasn't relaxed with the saddle on the back, why would you put a rider on it, a rider in, in there as well? So the idea, or isn't strong enough to carry the rider. So it's been wonderful working with Christina and Victoria. I'm looking for great things out of her in the, in the future. Will Favor from Art to Ride. The beautiful stretch there in the walk, and there's where we want to finish.